This is my first Glühwein of the season. And I'm here with the Consul General. Was könnt ihr denn alles sagen? Alles, sowieso. The infamous Christmas pickle ornaments. Many Americans think this is a German tradition. The Merz Apotheke, this still has German on it. 3994 Sippungen. They have a little Krampus. It's, it's really good. <laughs> Hello, servus, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. As you guys probably know, my name is Feli. I'm originally from Munich, Germany, but I've been living in Cincinnati, Ohio, on and off since 2016. But right now I'm on my way to Chicago, Illinois. It's like a four, five, six hour drive from Cincinnati, kind of depends on the traffic and stuff. I got up really early this morning, like at five, 30. Uh, that's also why I look a little bit tired. I'm trying to fix that before we get there because the whole reason that I'm going to Chicago is not just for fun. I mean, it's going to be fun as well, but it's to explore the German roots of Chicago in collaboration with the German American Heritage Foundation and the German Embassy in Washington, D.C. I talked about this a little in my video on German heritage in the U.S., but there are over 40 million Americans with German ancestry and German immigrants have shaped this country in many, many ways. Levi Strauss, for example, the in inventor of the blue jeans was from Bavaria. Um, his original name, his German name was Löb Strauss and then he changed it to Levi Strauss. Um, or John Roebling uh, was from Prussia and he was the architect who um, built the Roebling Bridge in Cincinnati and also the Brooklyn Bridge in New York City. To explore all those different traces of German influences in the US, the Heritage Foundation has recently created a really cool website called German Roots USA. I'll put the link down here and on that website you can find a map and the map shows all the different places that have German heritage to them so like whether that's um, a restaurant or clubs or landmarks businesses whatever it might be you can find it there and you can find some really cool background information about those places as well and they reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to travel to some of these places and check out the German roots there and I said yeah, of course I want to. So this weekend I'll be exploring the German roots of Chicago, which by the way is one of my absolute favorite cities in the entire country. I'll be visiting the German consulate in Chicago and talking to the consul general there. Um, I'll be checking out the infamous Chicago Christmas market that opens today, the Christkindl market. It's kind of funny because it's like a mix of the Bavarian word Christkindl and then like American or English market, the Christkindl, the Christkindl market. Um, I'm very excited for that, especially because I feel like it's it's really time to get into Christmas mood now. And I'll also be visiting the German cultural center Dank House or Dank House. I think I'm going to find out tomorrow how they pronounce it. And of course, I'll be taking you with me. So we're here at the consulate now in Chicago and I'm here with the Consul General is what it's called, right? General Consul. That's what I'm called. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm always get confused because it's the other way around in English. In mm -hmm. German we say General Consul. Um, Wolfgang Mössinger, um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming. Yeah. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. As you can see, he has an amazing view here. And I am here this weekend to kind of discover the German roots of Chicago and I think for Germans especially, but I think also for Americans, when they think of the city of Chicago, most people think mostly of like a stereotypical American big city with a big skyline, you know, theaters, lots of things to do, the lake, of course, but not a lot of people realize that there's also a lot of German heritage here in Chicago, German roots. So where can people see those German roots or how can we experience the German roots here in Chicago? Many people say that Chicago is the archetypical American city. Mm -hmm. Part of that is, of course, the many, many different ethnic communities that are here. Yeah. Uh, and with the German community, it's probably more complicated than with others. Mm -hmm. Because Germans have tended to integrate pretty rapidly. And after two world wars, in which we were the enemies, of course, many Germans kind of played down a bit their German roots. And once they got more successful, they moved into the suburbs. Yeah. There is still the old German quarter, Lincoln Square, 
Yeah, we still have the Dunkhaus mm -hmm. and some other German traditional uh, institutions, organizations, but uh, people, the Germans don't live there anymore, mm -hmm. at least not in big numbers. So it's not so visible then to go into the Mexican quarter in the in Chinatown that there are many Germans. Uh, they are spread out all over Chicago land. Mm -hmm. But when they come together at the Dunkhaus for events. They come together at certain moments and days like the Steuben Parade, Oktoberfest and things like that. But it's not so easy to, to simply walk around somewhere and feel like you were back in Germany. Yeah, there's no little Germany. There is no little Germany. There is a little little stretch of road of Lincoln Avenue in Lincoln Square near the Dunkhaus, mm -hmm. which has a little bit the feel of a German main street. The German Consulate General Chicago is one of eight German consulates in the U.S. and is responsible for a big territory of 13 states in the Midwest, a region with a lot of German heritage. You can still see the strong connections to Germany when you look at the sister cities, such as Chicago and Hamburg, Indianapolis and Cologne, St. Louis and Stuttgart, Cincinnati and Munich, and many, many more. Wolfgang Mössinger, who was born in Baden-Württemberg, the southwest of Germany, has been the consul general here since 2019. Unlike the German embassy that's located in Washington, D.C., the consulates don't do negotiations with the U.S. government. But besides that, they take on a lot of similar tasks. I mean, the name of the consulate comes from the fact that consulates usually do consular work. Mm -hmm. Makes Although sense. I, I have been working in a consulate that does everything else but consular work, but leave that aside <laughs> for the moment. Um, so our main job, and that's why the taxpayer pays for this here, the German taxpayer, mm -hmm. is that we have to help those people who are either German citizens and have all kinds of bureaucratic requirements like new passports, certificates they inherited in Germany and need some stamps. They need uh, certificates for translating official documents mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff, but mainly passports. We are there to provide for them. We are kind of a German town hall for the Germans mm -hmm. here. Uh, and then, of course, not so much at the moment because of COVID, but in ordinary times, we are also here to issue visas mm -hmm. for those people who have to have visas to go to Germany, for example. American citizens traveling as tourists to Germany don't need that, of course. But there are lots of citizens of other countries living in this area who do need a passport, like Indians, Russians, Chinese, and so on and so on. And then even some group of Americans do need visas to mm -hmm. go to Germany if they want to start a, a job, yeah. if they want to study, or if they want to get married. In this order. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so that's a part of what we do and half of my staff of about 20 people is doing that. Mm -hmm. And then we have, of course, uh, um, eight honorary consuls mm -hmm. in the area who do a lot of day-to-day -day consular support yeah. for, for the Germans and for whoever needs the support uh, on site. But the other half is doing uh, basically what an embassy does, mm -hmm. is doing uh, political work, is doing press work, cultural and uh, economic uh, support. So you mentioned that you also have projects in the cultural field, co yes. collaborating with all yes. these different uh, German-American mm -hmm. um, societies and institutions here. So what are some of those projects that you do? Uh, we, we always try to bring these heritage associations a little bit more into the modern times, mm -hmm. because sometimes they are very much uh, in the old times. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Which is okay, because yeah. that's why they have been founded and to keep the people kind of uh, attached to their to their old uh, culture. Yeah, that's what I always say. It's like, it's great that they want to maintain the tradition, but as a modern yeah. German, you yeah. feel like you're traveling back in time in a way. Yeah, and they have to do Oktoberfest and things like that simply for fundraising reasons. Mm -hmm. That's also very legitimate. Mm -hmm. And there's now a younger generation in many of these associations who really want to be more relevant for today mm -hmm. and also to reach out to more younger people. So do you, as a, the whole consulate, reach out to these different associations and kind of make suggestions or guide them in certain directions? Or um, do, you, do you collaborate with them with funding? Or how does this work exactly? Everything. Okay. Everything. We have funding available, small, small funding mm -hmm. available. We support them. We guide them. Sometimes we have special funds available for spe 
specific events, anniversaries, and so on and so on. And then, of course, we are happy to help when they have issues on how to modernize their association. And you just mentioned the Oktoberfest. Now, mm -hmm. I've talked about the Oktoberfest in Cincinnati yeah. before. We have also different Oktoberfests by the different organizations yeah. in Cincinnati. Um, what's the Oktoberfest like here in Chicago? Is it a big street festival or is it an indoor event? Mm -hmm. Have you been? It's usually celebrated together with the Stoiben Parade. Okay. End of September. So like it's like in outside? It's outside, it's a big tent, and it's the place where the Stoiben Parade ends. Okay. So the people who have participated in the Stoiben Parade then gather there for, yeah, for eating and drinking, basically, and for music. Um, and it's big. It's huge. It's lots of thousands and thousands of people of, yeah. over a couple of days. And the Stoiben Parade features something like 50-something organizations which okay. who participate. And that's the moment when probably you can see how much German heritage is still in Chicago land. Mm -hmm. The Stoiben Parade honors the Prussian-born Baron Friedrich von Stoiben, who offered his services to General George Washington during the Revolutionary War and helped make the victory against the British possible by training the American troops. From traditional clubs such as the Donauschwaben or the various German singing clubs to those that try to manifest more modern German culture such as the Dankhaus or the Schwaben Soccer Club, you can find over 40 German-American societies in the area. While most of those organizations mainly focus on maintaining the German language and culture in the US, the German-American Chamber of Commerce promotes business relations between the two countries. Their Midwest chapter is headquartered in Chicago and is a great point of contact for German businesses that want to enter the American market. The chamber is also the organizer of the annual Christkindle market in downtown Chicago, which is where I was headed next to meet the chamber's marketing manager, Laila Schmidt, a fellow German. Okay, so we're at the Chicago Christkindle market now. This is my first time here. It's it's kind of like a famous Christkindle market. Like people have told me so many times before that I need to check this out. And I'm here with Lila. Is it the big, biggest Christkindle market in the whole country, or like? Because I know it's so so famous, but like, what's so special about it? So it is the most authentic one outside of Europe. So and we've been the first one, right? We've been here since 1996. So th this year we are actually celebrating our 25th anniversary. So we have one location here at Daily Plaza, and then we also have a location at Wrigleyville at Gallagher Way. So I'm here for the 25th anniversary for the first time then and I guess I'm kind of lucky because last year it didn't take place right because of COVID and then unfortunately I learned today uh, which for you guys you will already know this now when you're seeing this but I learned today that most of the German Christmas markets are again not happening this year which is really sad because I was really looking forward to them so I'm really excited now to at least get some of the Christmas atmosphere here in Chicago and yeah if it's really authentic then you know it might make me feel like home a little bit and we're just gonna go around and check it out now. And it honestly did feel like home a lot, from Christmas ornaments to socks, candles, and delicacies like gourmet cheeses and honey, you can find pretty much everything you'd find at a German Christmas market, plus some more touristy products like these very detailed beer steins or these cuckoo clocks from the Black Forest, Schwarzwald. A big reason as to why the Chicago Christkindle market feels so authentically German is that a lot of the vendors actually fly in from Germany. Some of them told me that they set aside two to three months every year to come to the Chicago Christkindle market. And it's not just the products that are authentic, the market looks like home too. So all of our huts have the same design, right? It's the red and white striped wooden booth. So these are imported actually from Europe. Oh, cool. So that's what makes it authentic, um, as we are modeled after the original in Nuremberg. Yes. In addition to German vendors, as well as locals, you'll also find international ones from other countries all over the world, like this one from Ecuador, for example. There are 55 booths in total that, besides merchandise, also sell a lot of amazing food. From German classics, like Bratwurst and potato pancakes, to Bavarian meals like pretzels, Leberkass or Weißwurst, to Swiss raclette, they have everything you could possibly imagine. And you'll even find modern German street food like northern German Matthias Brötchen, 
Döner or Currywurst. You won't find this at a lot of other traditional places in the US, but like this is typical German fast food that you'll find in Berlin a lot, but also all over the place. So Currywurst, really good. And of course, lots of sweet delicacies as well. I wish you guys could smell this right now because it smells so Christmassy and so much like home. And I know I sound super cheesy right now, but it's just true. If you've ever smelled roasted almonds, you know what I'm talking about. It's really hard not to want any when you smell it. We also have that smell at Munich Oktoberfest as well. So like it either reminds me of Oktoberfest or of like Christmas time. But as you can see, of course, the US doesn't just offer one or two varieties. No, they offer like a thousand. <laughs> And then we get to the highlight of the night, the Glühwein, mold wine, that they serve in their custom-made Glühwein mugs. You can watch this on the Chicago Chris Kindle Market Instagram page, by the way, because Lila did a live stream of me testing the Glühwein. Yes. Annual mug, as you can see. Let's yes. see what, her, what she says. First of all, this is my first Glühwein of the season. Usually I get some uh, bottled Glühwein at uh, the American Aldi, for example, the Aldi supermarket. This year I haven't gotten any yet, and I uh, haven't had any here anywhere yet. So this is going to be the first of the season, which is always a reason to celebrate. And uh, let's see if this is authentic. It's really hot, I think. It's really good. I like it. <laughs> it's very good. Okay. It's not too sweet either. Okay. But um, yeah, it always has sugar in it. So for all of you who've never had Glühwein, prepare for a hangover if you drink too much of it. Because <laughs> alcohol with sugar causes a hangover, but it's awesome. Awesome. <laughs> it's okay, so we're masked up because we're going in one of these indoor little tents or huts. And you can see that there is a German street sign for a one-way street, Ein Bahnstraße. Hofbräu. Oh, they even have the um, Christmas pickle ornaments here, the infamous Christmas pickle ornaments that I've talked about before because many Americans think that this is a German tradition to have one of these, hide it in the Christmas tree, and then the first kid who finds it gets an extra present. But um, yeah, in Germany, nobody has ever heard of that before. I think it might be a very regional thing from like one village in Germany or something like that, but it's not a common German tradition at all. This is super cool because they have German advent calendars, even one of the like self-made ones that are pretty typical in German families, but also some of the ones that you can just buy that are filled with typically chocolate, but they can also be filled with other, other things. They're called Adventskalender in German and every kid usually has one and also some adults have one. And that's like to have the countdown starting on December 1st to Christmas Eve. So you have 24 little doors with presents or chocolates. We went inside another hut where I discovered all kinds of German candy that is usually hard to get in the US and Nürnberger Lebkuchen. So here we have the infamous Nürnberger gingerbreads, the Lebkuchen, which Nürnberg is kind of like the Christmas capital in Germany in a way because they have the most famous Christmas market there and the Lebkuchen, which is also just a classic German Christmas food that we have. And you have like the chocolate covered ones, the just sugar glazed ones or the plain ones. So these are really good. And then, of course, they have a little Krampus statue. I don't know what this is. Image in like southern Germany and Austria. This is the person or the thing that accompanies Nikolaus. So Saint Nicholas, who comes on December sixth to like he's kind of like a version of Santa Claus, but in Germany we kind of have both. And so he punishes the people or the kids who didn't behave well. In northern parts of Germany, they have Knecht Ruprecht in, instead. But Krampus is like a typical like monster-like creature, as you can tell, with like hooves and stuff. And they do the Krampus runs, the Krampus Läufe. Um, they also have one in Cincinnati. I don't know if they have one here, where like people dress up as this creature and chase other people through the streets. So that's fun. <laughs> fun German stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah, we're getting our Bavarian footage now. Real quick, what do you want to hear? Oh, we oh gosh, uh, I don't know what you guys play. Well, he plays the accordion. <laughs> no, like, uh, <laughs> play me your favorite song.
The next day, I was invited to visit the German American Cultural Center Dankhaus that Mr. Messinger mentioned earlier. Dank means thanks in German, but in this case also stands for Deutsch Amerikanischer Nationalkongress, German American National Congress. It's a nationwide German American nonprofit organization that was established to unite Americans of German descent and preserve their heritage and traditions. It has over 30 chapters throughout the US, and the headquarters are located here at the Dunkhaus in the traditionally German neighborhood of Lincoln Square in the northern part of Chicago. I honestly didn't really know what to expect before I got there, but I found out quickly that the Dunkhaus is gigantic and very diverse, that the people there speak a lot of German, and that they're very welcoming. They greeted me with a German lunch in their beautiful Skyline Lounge. And this is where we host our monthly Stammtisch event, which is the social event. People come and drink beer, and um, every month there's a different menu of German food. Okay. Curly, curly wurst, uh, bratwurst, always something like that. Who provides the food? We cook it here ourselves. Okay, yeah. so is there a kitchen behind there? Or? Yes, there is a prep kitchen. Today we have catered food, so yeah. it's not cooked by us, but... Um, we have a, a bunch of volunteers that cook every single month. That's insane. And this whole place looks so nice. It looks like a festa, like a ballroom, pretty much. Yes. Uh, a few years ago, we redid the gold, the gilding on the walls and uh, updated the floor. And we do have weddings here every once in a while. So people, people definitely love the room. They had Bavarian classics like Käsespätzle, red cabbage, pretzels, Obatsta, which is a cheese-based bread spread, and schnitzel prepared by the local German restaurant Himmels, as well as some delicious Black Forest cake and Christmas cookies from the local bakery Sel Marie. Over lunch, the museum director of the Dankhaus, Rosa Gallagher, told me a little more about its history. So the building was built in 1927 by a German architect, actually, but we didn't come into the building as the Dunkhaus until 1967, a good while later. And we started off as a lobbying organization, actually, for German Americans in the aftermath of World War II, who were afraid that the discrimination like happened in World War I was going to happen again. So they wanted to advocate for German Americans. It ended up that that kind of discrimination didn't really happen during World War II. People were assimilated. Um, and so over time, we became more of a public cultural center. The, the first thing, I think, was the language school, a Saturday school where people wanted their kids to speak German just like they did when they came here. So from the language school, it grew into, um, in the 90s also, and, and in the early aughts, having a public museum, an art gallery, and uh, having paid staff, too. So it started to be less of a membership club and more of like a public cultural center. We also are uh, home to a lot of German clubs that hold their meetings here because they don't have their own building. So do they just rent out the place? Yep, they rent out our various spaces. We have 77,000 square feet here, so there's uh, no shortage of room for them to have their meetings. Saturday is the main day for the language school. About 120 kids and 100 adults take German classes here every week, and for the little ones, there's even a daily preschool. Seid ihr ein Zug? Eine Eisenbahn? Das hier ist vierte Klasse. Okay. Das ist Grade, Heine Sie. Cool. Yeah. They're so old. Hi, Danica. Wie läuft's? <lacht> Hallo. Hallo. Was könnt ihr denn alles sagen? Alles. Alles, sowieso. Und was macht ihr heute? <lacht> habt ihr schon ah, gesungen heute? Cool. Also für Thanksgiving. Was Wenn habt ihr denn gesungen? Sehr cool. Ja, noch so richtig cool. Ah, okay. Ernst Dankfest. After class, the kids get to try some tricks on these German aero wheels called Rhönrad. Meanwhile, I was headed towards the Brauhaus room, where a group of people was getting ready for their weekly Kino event, where they watch a German movie over coffee and cake. The space is also used by the Brandenburger Schützenverein, the shooting club, and of course you can get a beer here, with real German brewery atmosphere. Part of the Dunkhaus mission is to salvage and take in a lot of the lost German culture yeah. in our neighborhood. And so we were able to do that this year, or the past year during COVID, when we 
we're able to salvage the Bra House bar from the Bra House restaurant across the street. Okay. Did the restaurant close? Or? It did. Okay. The so owners retired. Yeah, this looks super they did, nice. They didn't want to. They didn't want to, you know, give it to anyone else. So they called the Dunk House and said, "Do you want any of it?" Yeah, and we, yeah we do. Yeah. So we were able to take it here, and it fit perfectly. So everything in here, from the columns and everything in here, came from the original Bra House. And was that originally German? Well, it was built by quite a few German immigrants. Okay. And you know, these were all uh, people who were born in Germany or first generation. German Americans right. and they created a spot that was you know iconic mm -hmm. you know I've lived in this neighborhood 30 years and my kids all grew up there mm -hmm. everyone here has a story about the Brow House mm -hmm. so when they're able to come here and see this in person it's it's an amazing thing Besides the Schützenverein, the Dunkhaus also rents out rooms to the German-American Police Association, the Siebenbürger Sachsen, as well as the Schlaraffia Club, a worldwide men's-only association that uses old-fashioned German language and holds their meetings in a fixed ceremonial form. Their meeting spaces are called Schlaraffen Castle and are equipped in the style of a knight's tavern from the Middle Ages. Is that real? Yes. Ew. So this room was taken from the Germania Club, another German club that closed in the 80s. Yeah. And it was brought here, all the wood, all the furniture was brought here. And yeah, I was, I was asking because um, this doesn't look like the rest of the building. This looks, looks like an old building inside of here. So Yes, it's totally different. People walk in here and they're like really dumbfounded at this. Yeah. And the members still meet here uh, every Friday in the winter. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, 3,994 Sippungen, that means they've had 3,994 meetings. Mm -hmm. So Sippung is this old term for meeting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so for they, Sitzung, one, one zips mm -hmm. to have a meeting. Yeah, this reminds me, I've, I've seen this before in Cincinnati, but it reminds me a lot of like the Karneval um, Vereine and Vorstände in the Cologne area especially. Yes, a lot of uh, capes and costumes and... Uh, Performance, yeah. I believe. So I've never been to a meeting because mm -hmm. I'm a woman, mm -hmm. um, but I hear it's there's a lot of poetry and humor that goes on there. Last but not least, I visited the current exhibition "Lost German Chicago" at the Dunkhaus Museum. It covers German migration to Chicago, as the name suggests, including the journey. And I especially love. This piece here, that was here when I started working here, and I uh -huh. later noticed that it's a passport from a woman who is from Bottrop, which okay. is where my mom is from in Germany. That's it's funny. a little town yeah. in the West. Um, then we also cover some of the political upheavals that have happened in Chicago, in which Germans played a big role, like the beer riots of 1855, where the mayor cracked down on drinking on Sundays, which the Germans mm -hmm. did not like. Yeah. And so they kind of revolted about that. And one of the most famous uh, events in Chicago history uh, is the Haymarket Affair of 1886, where Germans, uh, some German anarchists, were fighting for the eight hour workday. And it came to a day of violence where some people lost their lives and eight of them were sentenced to death. They also have some pieces from the old Chicago Germania Club, including these wood pieces that show scenes from operas by Richard Wagner. The Germania building has been declared a historical landmark, by the way, and can be rented out for events nowadays. During World War I, the Germania Club actually became the Lincoln Club mm -hmm. for a while. They changed their name because of the anti-German discrimination during that time. Yeah. I mentioned it in my um, German Heritage video before, and I've also done a lot of research about that in Cincinnati, but it's crazy how like all over the country, clubs and people changed their names, tried to like kind of hide their German connection because they were scared of the consequences. Some people even got lynched, but a lot of people just got straight up discriminated. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So there, and especially the uh, German language yeah. was under attack, and the German press. That's something that the immigrants in the predominantly German neighborhood Lincoln Square had to deal with as well at the time. Today, there are only a few spots left that still remind of the German connections, such as Jean's Sausage Shop that is run by Polish owners, but is located in the building of the former German deli shop Maya's Delicatessen. 
And even today, you can find all kinds of German products here, including Glühwein. The Merz Apotheke in the neighborhood isn't run by a German family anymore either, but has been able to keep up the German spirit. Here, as you can see, the Merz Apotheke, this has, still has German on it, so Apotheke is obviously a German word for pharmacy, and German pharmacies look very different than pharmacies in the US, especially nowadays. Um, and this one is still like old-fashioned even for German standards, but it's kind of more similar to what we will find in Germany to this day. And it says gegründet 1875, so founded in 1875. Here are all these um, German natural products. Germans will recognize this, Kneipp, Badeöl. It smells very strong in here. <laughs> I wish you guys could smell that. Oh yeah, Veleda. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they specialize in homeopathic and natural medicine and import products directly from Germany and other European countries. This lantern pole is an actual piece of Germany in Chicago. It was sent over as a gift from Chicago's sister city of Hamburg in 1979 and is a replica of the lanterns that you'll find at Hamburg's Lombard Bridge, which is why it's called the Lombard Lamp. And our last stop for the day was something that I definitely didn't expect to come across in the neighborhood. So this segment of the Berlin Wall, it's a full size 12 foot segment of the wall. Mm -hmm. And it was given to the city of Chicago by the city of Berlin mm -hmm. in 2008. And they're restoring it now, which is nice because, uh, you know, it continues to deteriorate. Yeah. Uh, and we're in the Western Brown Line train station, <laughs> as you can hear. <laughs> and... Um, so in 2008, uh, our a really famous Chicago mayor called Mayor Daly was here for the ceremony where they gave it to us. Okay. That's really cool. You would never expect to just see a piece of the Berlin Wall like in the middle of Chicago. I had a subway station at that. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people don't notice it because it kind of blends in with the surroundings. <laughs> it, it does. You might just think that it's just some, you know, modern piece of art, some graffiti art or something. Yeah, exactly. Even though I get to see a lot of traces of the German roots in Chicago over the weekend, there's still so much more that I didn't even have time to go to, such as the Goethe Monument in Lincoln Park or the traditional German restaurant and brewery, the Berghof. I did, however, get lunch at a German fusion restaurant before I left on Sunday. Okay, so I just had lunch at Funkenhausen, which is this German fusion restaurant here in Chicago, which is a great mix of um, like southern style American food and then German food. And I had Spätzle Carbonara, which was awesome because I love Spätzle, German food, and I love Italian food. So the Carbonara part of it didn't have it with bacon, of course. Um, and now it's time for me to head back to Cincinnati. It was an amazing weekend here in Chicago to discover the German roots of the city. There was so much. Um, I could have probably stayed for another week or two to see all the different parts of Chicago that have German roots. Everyone was so kind and welcoming. It was really, really interesting. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this little journey with me too. Don't forget to check out GermanRootsUSA.org to check out all the German roots all over the country. Um, and yeah, I hope I'll see you in my next video. If you like my content, please don't forget to subscribe and activate the bell. And of course, you can also support me by hitting the super thanks button, um, join my Patreon family or buy me a drink on buymeacoffee.com. Thank you so much for watching and I hope I'll see you next time. Tschüss.